Hi guys. So I have something special for you today. I am doing an interview with Kavita Krishnan. You already know her. I am not going to spend much time introducing her or wasting time doing any of the usual stuff. The channel, this video is going to be members only for the first uh, 24 hours and then it's going to become free for everyone to watch. So if you're a member, thank you in advance. If you're not a member, you can become a member by clicking the join button below. You get early access to videos and interviews and uh, that's it. We're going to talk to Kavita ji about democracy for the most part. So here she is. Hi. Hi, Vimo. It's my Hello. pleasure to be here. It's oh, so good pleasure to is all mine. chat. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. And uh, I think it's uh, a little like these are not really hopeful times. We're doing this on <laughs> we're doing this on December 21st, 2023. I, for one, I'm feeling quite down. I, I spoke to I, I do a live stream on Wednesday and I spoke to everyone how pessimistic I'm feeling. Uh, how are you feeling about the state of democracy in India right now? Yeah, I don't think uh, there is any room to feel, you know, tremendously optimistic or uh, rosy eyed and not just in India. I think that this is a problem that goes way beyond our country alone. And um, it is a very, very tough situation. But I like to say, uh, or at least I like to try to do this, that I say ki, um, umid ki kasrat karne chahiye. So it's like daily exercise. You get up and you do make an effort. Why make that effort is I think because uh, democracy is something which each of us needs. Even those, even those who are arguing against democracy, who are supporting forces they think are great, but you know, that are anti-democratic. Um, in, a, in actual fact, democracy is something that they need too. So mm. this is something we all need. It's for the survival of the planet and of the world we inhabit. So we have to. We have to be optimistic about the possibility that democracy will We have to fight. We have die. to have enough hope to fight. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. So in what way can the average citizen who is feeling dismayed at the present moment fight? Because to, one day ago, Practically, the entire opposition was thrown out of the parliament and laws that had to do with the and the, the actual legal system of India, the penal code, etc. were changed completely without opposition being present in the parliament. Uh, we have had several such decisions made in the past few years. The farm laws were passed like this. The, ITs, uh, the, the citizenship law was passed like this. And there have been a few other examples. And we saw protests. Uh, because of which at least some things were taken back. Do you think there is any scope of something like that happening right now? Because I'm not, to, I'm also not feeling very optimistic about opposition unity. No, I think that uh, political opposition will do what it must. And absolutely, this is, as you said, a completely open, uh, you know, flouting of democracy. It's a mockery of democracy if you're not going to, if you're going to throw opposition out. Um, but I think that, you know, what parties can do is what parties can do. They must do. But I would say, and you asked, you know, what should people do who are feeling uh, bad about what's happening? Let me put it a little differently. I think that we all need to rethink <clears throat> about our own assumptions about what is bad, what is good, and how to engage with people we share this country with. Um, to understand what is democracy and that democracy is something that is not partisan. So the attempt to make democracy something that is partisan, where if you want opposition in parliament, that means you are a urban Naxal or you are and you're, you're a Congress person. And if you want only BJP in parliament and BJP supporters, then you are nationalist or whatever, you know. So democracy is not really about BJP and Congress. Yes, there may be policies uh, BJP follows uh, that it uh, pursues which harm democracy. But I think that the first conversation to have is not enough to say, look, BJP is threatening democracy. Mm -hmm. I would say that anyone listening to this with, uh, you know, who wants to do something, I think we all need to think about how we can begin to have a conversation with ordinary people 
who don't share our views, our neighbors, our family, whatever. So I know it's easier said than done, but my effort in recent times has been to not go into the uh, polemic mode of, okay, somebody says something and I present them with facts and you know say, this is wrong, this is wrong, and so on. Um, I played by ear and I feel that we should first listen. Uh, and once one listens and waits and goes beyond the, you know, the, the provocative slogans and the, you know, the, the, you know, whatever the things that are being said, which are supposed to rile us up and wait and see, just to listen to people to understand what it is that they are looking for, what mm -hmm. it is that are their concerns actually. And wait a little bit more to understand whether, you know, before we decide that those concerns are only, and I don't mean only the very vocal opinionated people. I'm saying just ordinary people. If you yeah. speak to people and you have to make that effort to yeah. speak to people in the community you live in who just may not have much to do. And they have a vague idea, okay, government is good. Modi is very popular. He's going to win. No one else is going to win. Oh, it's okay, you know. So I think that, you know, listening to people, and actually waiting for some real concerns to emerge rather than dissing uh, the whole thing completely. I think maybe we should begin there, begin with a little less uh, certainty in our approach, like totally confident that we are morally right, others are wrong. And from there, I think to understand what is democracy, to get to that conversation. For instance, okay. I'm just saying, uh, how do you define it? Okay, uh, democracy, is it just majority rule? Uh, what is it exactly? And how is it understood? How has its meaning emerged? So I think what we'll see is that people, in fact, you know, people have people have made the meaning of democracy, which is now universally understood. You know, if you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for instance, how did that come about? That is not just some people in the West sitting and doing it, you know, or, or you know, our constitution, you know, oh, it's not just that they just read up some books in the West and they did it actual living people who emerged from, for instance, workers struggles, who fought for the right to form unions in the early 20th century. They are, it is because of them that you have the right to freedom of association. Yeah. So right to freedom of and association is exactly the, the right to, what? The weekend, also, of course. The but weekend. Yeah, the weekend, but even I'm just saying something which is a universal human right, which yeah. today is being denied. Because you, mm. the right to you, you know, freedom of association <clears throat> is the right to form a party, the right for that party to have equal rights with others, the right to propagate, the right to run a magazine or a portal without mm. facing threats, intimidation, and uh, 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 victimization and arrest and so on and so forth, right? Um, so the whole point is that, that that came out of worker struggles, that came out of ordinary people's struggles, and they were not all you know, card carrying left or anything like that. These are these these are some things everyone needs. Hmm. Likewise, I think uh, just the idea of an why an opposition is important uh, is, I think, important for people to understand the weight and value of their own vote. Because if you have a government that takes you completely for granted, that has nothing to fear from anyone, and you basically have no option but to support that government, then um, the government doesn't have to serve you in any way, right? And an example of that in real time is basically what has, uh, what has happened in Russia, for instance, where you have a real instance and Russia, you know, uh, and India has a tradition of democracy. It's, in, it's democratic institutions have come about, people have struggled and so, uh, we still have that capital with which we are working and we are trying to talk about democracy. In Russia, uh, historically, there hasn't been that kind of a democracy except for a very tiny window of time. So essentially, uh, you're having a people who think this is the way it is. And yeah. you're left with a situation where one man takes all decisions. There is complete fear. There is no social media except what uh, is allowed by the government and, you know, and no one can say, I think I would like to do something else. And this means that anyone, a feminist, a gay person, you know, um, just someone who's a student wants to pursue a research subject, uh, which is which the government says is forbidden. OK, um, certain aspects of Second World War. OK, 
you're not supposed to go there. You're not supposed. To. So the point is then it's not a free society and that harms anybody. It's not just harming those who um, who think that they uh, they oppose this government. It harms everyone. Hmm. And uh, I said that about the you're NRC list about... as well. Yeah. Huh. You, you're, you're primarily talking, hmm. sorry for interrupting, but you're primarily no, talking about conversations we have with fellow citizens who yes. we understand also have a stake in the goodwill of their families, themselves, the market, etc. Uh, what do you say when the conversation is primarily happening on dishonest grounds? You're talking to someone who thinks that these people should be hurt, these people should be killed, these people should be thrown out of the country. Is there a middle ground there also? Because it feels like there can't be. No, no, that's what I'm trying to say that, see, if you're speaking to someone whose job it is to essentially, uh, you know, waste your time by making these arguments and I'm not talking about engaging in that, but I'm saying in your family, in your neighborhood, you know, in your you're going to meet people who say this, who repeat this, who think like yeah. this. My point is that I, I, I have. Uh, um, I've learned with some difficulty, I think, at least I try to do this to think that, well, this is an, a random person, okay? This is not someone who is a trained activist or whatever. They are saying these things uh, for many, very, very many reasons of their own, their own insecurities, their own, you know, they are looking for convictions somewhere, and this has become something that they can draw upon as their identity. So they become, you know, you put it forward and then you kind of get aggressive about it. Um, sort of give it time. I don't counter things too much. I say I don't agree, but, and I try to find a way so that the conversation can come around at some point to a ground on which uh, we can actually talk about something maybe which is a shared concern a little bit. And without uh, talking about it in terms of BJP Congress, you know, who to vote for and all of that, to try and get some, because I feel as though the fundamentals are what are weak and have become very, you know, far weakened in the country. Ambedkar um, said that, uh, you know, uh, at the time when the constitution was adopted, that the roots of uh, this are very, are not sure. deep in our country. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, in they have become weakened for many reasons. So I find that young students don't have a sense of history. And when they come to university, you know, um, first year BA, speak to some uh, youngsters here. So they've come from a underprivileged background. They're here. They have been deprived of the basic foundation of education and they're here in university and they feel a sense of insecurity and uh, you know they don't feel good about themselves. How to feel good about yourself? So you go be part of a big, big group. ABVP shouting, Jai Shri Ram, let me go and shout that. I'm, I'm talking to you about real persons whom I mm -hmm. do know. And I know that the people who got through <clears throat> to them didn't do it by, uh, you know, getting into an argument and all of that. They did it with some patience, because when you speak to these kids, they, the first thing they would say is even about education. Oh, who needs all this? You know, it's all hopeless. It's bad. You know, who cares? Why? Because you're afraid that you are not equipped for it. And that's not yeah. your fault. You've been deprived of it. Yeah. And it's not just one government that's deprived you. This is historical. So gradually getting that person to the point where they feel an investment in themselves as well. It happened through that route that then there was a conversation open to talk about other things. And eventually by now, these uh, small young group of uh, students are people who value democracy and who are not uh, willing to uh, take for granted, you know, so that the government is doing something. They're not blind followers of the gov government or of a party. And okay. I think that that should be uh, the effort. And it's going to take effort. It's not something you can so take for granted. Given, given that you uh, acknowledged that the roots of what we call democracy are not very deep in India, and that there are deeper forces than that, which tend to take attention away from things like rights and uh, a sense of history given that that is the case and given the condition we are in right now where not only is the sense of detachment from history is being uh, 
increased like it's getting the difference between us and the reality of india is increasing and it's not even increasing through apathy it is literally being encouraged like through government institutions etc textbook changes and all and the fact that we are literally a couple of months away from the next general election do you see hope in that election and do you see that uh, things can change see um the way i think about it is that uh, to me democracy has always been i mean this is not just about the last few years i always feel that democracy is not about uh, it's not about a system it's it's about uh, so it's not the tantra so much as the lok so it is about how much people are participating hmm. in democracy and that doesn't mean just casting a vote or making a political decision about who to vote for it it doesn't even mean choosing between a menu of uh, you know uh, agenda that is being offered by this or that party it actually means thinking about what we need and working for that so today i would say that with the elections close by even in the elections what should a citizen do and think about and i think that if one values uh, one's vote um, there are many uh, reasons why you may vote for someone or not someone but the first thing i think is important is uh, that there should be a transparency and if i cast a vote into a you know a physical box sure somebody can steal that box but with smartphone someone will see them stealing it it will become an issue and uh, it's out there if it's in a machine and i'm not saying i'm not questioning the validity of any election result for me that does that is not the concern for me the concern is that every vote of every person is equally important so count the vv pat uh, ballots count the ballots on the machine sure also count the vv pat ballots and this is something we should not leave to the courts we should not just say okay somebody in their wisdom will do something every citizen should feel invested in this including those who vote for the bjp including those who vote for an ally of the bjp whoever you are you should value your vote enough to say that i want a backup guarantee tomorrow if bjp is not in power or i am in a state where the congress is in power i don't want uh, i want the yeah, same exactly. thing there as well i want exactly because, the same thing yeah, yeah because you could totally make the argument that if evms were hacked or tampered with and the bjp is said to win in a certain state because of that you can always say the congress won in karnataka and evms were used there up, 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 apparently and there it did not turn out to be advantage bjp so see the uh, the thing is that i i think there are two things there see one thing is that the way in which uh, tampering can happen it's very obvious that tampering is not going to mean that uh, it it is going to be a calculation the person if theoretically if someone wants to tamper they will have to assess okay which seat should i am i can i do some tweaking so that there it will give us an advantage without looking out of you know out of the ordinary so they have to make a calculation they have to make a projection of so if you, if they get that projection wrong then the result is going to you know the other <laughs> other party will win and uh, i see this no matter which party is in power come on i mean corruption is a thing electoral corruption is a thing so uh, the point about the counting the ballots is i think that uh, we should not we as a citizen should not have to, people say oh prove that this election was uh, hacked prove that evms are hacked no i shouldn't have to prove to prove yeah. i'm not a technician i am an ordinary vote i don't understand machines i understand my vote and i understand it gets in here somebody counts it okay and it's kept safe till it's counted i do not understand that machine so mm. i want that the machine should produce a physical copy which is then going to be counted why is that such an unreasonable demand i should not yeah. have to prove that the machines don't work in order for this as let's assume the machine works hmm. what is the harm for a backup yeah. count to happen yeah that's it so you think all the uh... the controversy around evms possibly being hacked it is sufficient to ask for a vv pad slip and that will solve the matter i'm not saying that will solve solve what i won't solve a political outcome the society it will solve the, the suspicion about the democratic process 
I think that we should uh, today. Yes, I'm. I'm saying even if you don't have suspicion, you should want this as a uh, guarantee. We each should want to be sure, right? Hmm. Whether or not you like the out outcome of an election. That's the first. Okay. Second thing is that that's today. Tomorrow you may need other guarantees. You may need other. Uh, there are many things you want. So the other thing to do about the election is to try and find out who's paying for your party or candidate. Who's paying for which candidate? Do you have a way to find out? Is there a mm. transparent way to find out? Apparently, you can go to the website and figure out okay who has some criminal case against them. That also doesn't tell you too much because you have to find out. What was the context of that case? Was it in some andolan? Was it in some? Was it a, a a criminal act? What was it? The other thing is that uh, funding. So then, if you take the trouble to find out, then you realize that uh, the law made for transparency is basically elect, uh, allowing unknown, shadowy quarters to anonymously donate without their name getting public, donate large, large sums of money through electoral bonds. To uh, the parties, and so you cannot know: is that a good thing? Why is that mm. a good thing? So the other thing to ask to your election commission, your local MP, MLA, whatever, to get together as a society, even if you are 20 people living on a street, and say, no, we should have a right to know who's getting funds from where. If you are not doing that, then don't tell me that there is a bond. Hai, so you know the bank must be doing its uh, whatever, and we should not have to know. No, we deserve to know. Um, I think these are things we should ask, and then the other thing is to insist on voting without a fear. So the fear of somebody, the fear of a minority, or the anger or hatred for a minority, the desire to uh, put somebody else in their place. You know, don't vote from a place of negative, nasty emotions. Vote from a place of positive uh, energy. Positive uh, love for this country, for its democracy, even for those who disagree with us, and say that we want a place where even if some other party wins, I want uh, opposition to win. Fine, but that doesn't mean I want the opposition. Uh, if this if India wins, India Alliance, I don't want the other opposition to be labeled non-India, anti-Indian, and uh, thrown out of yeah. parliament or the country. No way, no way. Mm. Uh, I would say that uh, yes, then the you know you, we need an opposition, uh, absolutely, and we need these processes. Uh, so I think that is where one should go for, and one should try so, to get people around us to go for it. Yeah, I agree. But since we are talking about opposition, what are your, how hopeful are you that the India coalition is going to be, and co a coalition and number two effective. I think it's very good. It's a it's the best effort I've seen so far. I in many years, and I think that um, it looks like they have their act together. It's uh, it, it they do you know um, on the whole are doing a decent job. The thing is that um, you know it is uh, uh, something which I wish would have happened a lot earlier, and I yeah. also wish that it would. Go beyond <clears throat> an election, because I think that you need an alliance like that um, to have, you know, the idea that you can disagree on many things and have a united goal, and that goal should be a positive goal as well. When it's an election, it always seems okay. Uh, the goal is these things, and it's also a goal because you're an opposition, and that's an, you know, you're voting to defeat someone. Very important, yeah. no doubt. But I do think that uh, you know there there are other things that we need to keep doing, and uh, regardless of even if they win the election, that is something that should continue. In fact, should deepen much more. So, for instance, I really liked the idea of the the yatra, the um, Bharat Jodo yatra. Bharat Jodo yatra. So In I fact, felt uh, like after yeah. right after the Bharat Jodo yatra, I kind of said to the live stream audience here that I wish this has happened. I wish this had happened right after the CAA protest happened because that is when it would have been useful. So many people who uh, had to suffer the consequences of speaking to power, speaking truth to power, would not have if the opposition had come together and done something like that. Then it's good that it happened, but it should yeah. have happened earlier. 
No, I think almost as though that should become something which is a regular thing. It should be something that people can expect as an entitlement that we will have, uh, you know, leaders of parties. We will we will get a chance to speak to them. We will get a chance to talk to them, and we will have uh, the 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 limits of that. Con you know, the the idea is that there will be a space, a regular space, where ordinary people can come and talk or argue, but without the elements of hatred and all of that. So the idea that you know uh, uh, stuff that is uh, nasty. See, there is again that is something which is part of democratic training, which I think we are very weak in to understand yeah. the difference between a disagreement, no matter however heated, and dehumanization. Yeah. So, uh, you know, James Baldwin said this, you know, that uh, uh, you can you know disagree with me, and I'll I will support your right to disagree, you know, your right to say all that you want to, but the minute you stop, you know, you don't have a right to say something which disrespects me as a human being and that is not something that only uh, you know again i'll say of course the bjp turns this into a political art it is part of their political strategy to uh, to to feed on uh, hatred and fear to say you know muslims are this muslims are that and get people to vote uh, but i'm just saying just ask another ask yourself something else in, in, in anyone in the audience is there nothing, you know, suppose you believe, um, for instance, I've seen this all the time when it comes to uh, relationships or, you know, a transgender person, a gay person, where even someone otherwise very reasonable, okay, mm. even a feminist position or a live-in relationship, you know, or, or intercaste marriage, otherwise a person who is decent, who is a loving person, you know, all of that, a good person. Uh, when it comes to something where there's a prejudice, then they say, okay, my religion or my faith or my culture, uh, me in, in according to that, this is just, uh, you know, barbaric, inhuman, unnatural, whatever. And my God doesn't permit it. So uh, you do what you like, but that means that you are going to hell or you God forsaken or you can't be part of this community or this religion or whatever. You know, you start gatekeeping. So the point is that that is not an argument. You can't. And then if you challenge it, they'll say, but free speech. No, it's not free speech, you see, because you are dehumanizing that person. That person, again, read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It means that just because you're born human, you are born with the right to be yourself. That's it. Mm. And be yourself with all the freedom and rights that that comes with, with me, which means that you have the right you are human. You shouldn't have to prove that you are natural and human and this and that. Uh, you know that you should not have to say I I am uh, I have earned these rights. No, I'm born with them, and I I should not have to your acceptance either as a person or a community or a state. I don't need you to recognize me in order to be human and have those rights. So that is someone everyone needs to understand that I may not do something that you don't want to, but I should not dehumanize you. Suppose I'm not wearing a uh, slinky dress with a slit down the side. It's not something I'm really very comfortable doing, so I don't do it. I see someone who's doing it, and in my head, immediately a prejudice comes that, you know, you know, shallow kind of, you know, what is all this sexualized kind of clothing and all of that. But then I should be able to say to myself, I should be able to check my prejudice and say, uh, that is a person there. That person is dressing as they like, okay? Whether it's a burqa, hijab, whatever. I mm. don't know. I should want to know that person, what they think, <clears throat> what they're like, what they, you know. And that person is not what they're wearing. And yeah. I may not wear what they're wearing. I may not like it particularly, but I don't have to. It's not yeah. my business. Uh, my only yeah, like, interest uh, to, in them should be something else. Yeah. Like I do this live stream. Uh, once a week where I just invite people to come and we talk about religion and atheism. And sometimes the conversation, because it's about God, it turns to morality. And somebody pointed out that, uh, would you, like this thing that you're supporting their right to do, would you do it or would you allow your family to do it? And my answer was, the rules of 
culture and civilization should not depend on my personal preferences nor should they depend on your personal preferences do you think that we all need to agree is that each person is free to decide what they want to do with their life yes as long as that something that you are doing is Doesn't not taking away person. someone else's yes someone else's yes. dignity someone else's yeah. dignity and autonomy so yeah. i think that is really the key part you know which is why faith uh, religion uh, custom it's not the problem you know um it is uh, it's it's absolutely we all have people in our lives i do at any rate people who are uh, faithful to one or the other faith i have uh, devout hindus in my family some of whom believe in a whole set of uh, scriptures and uh, rituals others who do not but i think that uh, what i expect you know the, the the thing that unites us on which we are able to agree is that uh, okay those parts of uh, you know your your tradition or faith or whatever which are discriminatory which are uh, you know which which by their very actions are uh, you know dehumanizing on the basis of caste or gender those are not things that we should be continuing those are not hmm. things you should pass on to the next generation <clears throat> so i'm a generation whose parents and grandparents decided okay this stuff we can junk while you know teaching this lot so they didn't and yeah. there are of my generation also who are devout but yeah. uh, again i would keep saying that something positive something good that doesn't depend on uh you know uh, doesn't uh, depend on shaming someone else or excluding someone else i think that is really the most important thing okay uh i want to move on a little bit since we are like 15 minutes 20 minutes left uh to the general decline of democratic values across the globe uh you mentioned russia uh right now we are watching uh netanyahu having taken over israel in a very weird way trump But was it. recently uh taking america in a difficult direction before he was thrown out and now biden despite apparently being on the like if trump is evil biden was said to be good but then it's america but and biden is wholesale funding the uh attacks on palestine so is there a fundamental common reason behind all of it happening all over the world at the same time or are these cases of everyone getting fever for a different reason no i do think that there is a common cause out here let me try and uh, put this clearly as clearly as i can the first thing i think is that uh, you know what you said about good and evil that was really uh, useful because i think that uh, we should not think you know uh, think of the world as uh, we should not think we as people we are not a government we are people we don't have to choose between this government and that government okay this leader and uh, you know th this government uh, this state do i support the us do i support russia um, okay this is better than that one we don't have to why do we have to we have to support uh, anybody who is oppressed we have to support those who are um you know um fighting for democracy fighting for uh, the good good things always so that part should be really simple and we should not be demanding from anyone who in exchange for their support that mm -hmm. they first show us how good they are and you know let me give you an example we are here in india our society and our politics is right now a mess mm -hmm. if you're going to say to uh, people here who are suffering okay uh, minorities or uh, or or uh, oppressed castes or whatever that yeah i'd like to support you but what are your views on uh, this question or that question which maybe they'll have prejudices there that doesn't mean that you do not support those people right hmm. so you support the cause of the good while not uh, you know and you support the right principles absolutely so the first thing is that it's not about whether uh, you know the america is uh, good or israel is good or bad the point is that i think uh, what is it which is in this world uh, causing this situation what is the threat to democracy here so i think the the fundamental problem is that um we are uh, you know the the, the uh, there is an effort to say that democracy as it is understood in universal declaration of human rights 
that that universal has no meaning. Get rid of it. Oh, that is not democratic. That is just some Western elite value. And it's being imposed on everyone. Democracy means everyone will have, will define democracy in keeping with their civilizational. This should be very familiar to us because it's what's happening here. India is the mother of democracy. So why should we accept this Western uh, values wala constitution, which mm. says, uh, ca which abolishes caste, uh, which abolishes caste oppression. Uh, it's not, a, caste is not oppressive. So uh, Ram Madhav will write an article saying that, ca uh, you know, family caste, these are core, uh, India's core genius. And so um, village caste council is the unit of democracy. All of this is happening here. So the point is that uh, that means that I'll have a right to say this is democracy. Why should I have to de define democracy according to uh, UN uh, definition? Likewise, you have China saying that uh, by democracy, it's good governance, it's happiness. So I have told you my people are happy. I've said I'm governing really well and uh, I've abolished poverty. I say absolute poverty. Mm. Oh, I'd like mm. to come and check. No, you can't do that. I've told you now it's good, done. So the point is that then uh, good governance and happiness, what is this? The citizen does has no right, right? The, the right of the citizen to demand something, to change something, to that is not there, not accepted. How? Civilizational values. So uh, Xi Jinping can say, by uh, Islam in China should be Chinese. And I'm yeah. saying this is not Chinese, that is <clears throat> not Chinese, you stop this, stop that. Likewise, yeah. you have Trump. Let me give you an example. Uh, Trump in the US, what he, uh, what his government had done, they set up a commission to look into, to review the idea of inalienable human rights, as I said, that certain rights you're born with. And Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State under Trump, he explained the meaning of that commission. He said, look, uh, how can you say that people are born with rights just because they're human? They should have to earn those rights. They should have to, uh, you know, those are privileges that they should earn. And uh, the idea, you know, you can't just say that something is a human right. Who said it's a human right? Uh, if it goes against America's, uh, you know, natural law and natural rights as defined by whatever, you know, American uh, constitution the, in its first draft, which recognized slavery. So he's like, no, then then we have to get rid of it. So the idea is that, the, uh, you know, the, it's just like in our country where the idea of an individual citizen having rights, irrespective of caste and gender. Over there also, they are saying, look, abortion is not a right. Um, you know, uh, you know, protections against racism, not a right, being gay, yeah. not a right, etc. So this is a common feature. I'm trying to tell you that this is happening. It's not America versus the rest. It's happening in America. It's happening in China. It's happening in Russia. It's happening in India. It's happening in Hungary, in, uh, you know, in uh, Italy and in many places where they have not won elections. Such forces are very powerful and gaining power, saying we don't want one definition and one yardstick of democracy. We should be allowed to do what we like, where? Within certain spheres of influence. And by that, they, the word they use for it is they say multipolarity. So they say uh, we should have, you know, multi, multiple poles, therefore multiple definitions of democracy. What is a pole? A big power. As long as you have the power to enforce, you know, to control a certain sphere of influence, you do what you like in it and others have no right to ask you any questions. But this and this I find uh, very dangerous that a lot of people who are otherwise, you know, democratic, leftist, liberal, they are also supporting this. And they say, OK, OK, you know, multiple poles of influence. This is much more democratic. Now it's all America. But it's not all America. You know, uh, it's not just America that gets away with war crimes. It's, uh, you know, Netanyahu and Biden are doing it. Uh, yeah. Assad, has, Assad is doing it even now. He's been doing it for uh, uh, over a decade now with mm. Russia. So the same Russia who says, oh, we are all for <clears throat> Palestine and whatnot, they are killing Palestinians and Syrian civilians in Syria. OK, uh, Iran. OK, so uh, the so instead of us seeing the world as some camp in which we have to choose one or the other, we should say we are on the side of democracy in every place. And, uh, and when know, we say support, that, yeah, and when we say yeah. that we are on the side of democracy in every place, are we talking about a unified definition of democracy? Yes, I think that the bare minimum See, you can build on a definition, but you can't, you know, the bare minimum definition is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Thank okay. you. That is my agenda now. That is a flag. OK, so, because that's the bare minimum. You can't say I'll have a democracy, but no elections. 
I love democracy, but no protests. Yeah. So the example I say when people say, but you know, America is anti-democratic or you know, Britain is anti-democratic. Who are they? I said, who is they? The governments? I mean, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Biden. Why should I be? Okay, I'll be extremely critical of Biden. But mm. the, if you can't see that Biden's politics forces him to uh, take into account the fact that there are tens of thousands of Jews on the street and ordinary Americans on the street saying stop ceasefire in Palestine. That's something he, you know, he which makes him uneasy, uncomfortable. Maybe he keeps doing what he's doing, but it's part of his calculus. If it were Trump, Trump would say uh, these people, they're all anti-Americans, get rid of them. So mm. and why should I pay any attention? So I think the difference which I say is that why do the universal values matter, irrespective of the government or not? The point is that those values are things we want, people want before us, our ancestors, whatever. And it means that when uh, America invades Iraq or Afghanistan, the biggest protests happen in America, where people tell their government, look at those universal values and rules. You are violating them. You should be punished. America is not punished. Bush is not punished. Fair enough. Putin also is not punished. Xi Jinping is not punished at all. Okay, Modi hasn't been punished. America, mm. in fact, is happy to do deals with Modi. Okay, they've told Modi, Ki, tu kar le. you do deals with Russia also, you do deals with us also. That is multipolarity. Multipolarity means no morals. Okay, it's actually zero morality, zero democracy, no values. Is as the opposite as... of... Sorry yeah. to interrupt on this point, but is the opposite of multipolarity... Unipolarity or bipolarity? That's what they say. See, the, 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 the attempt they try to say but is what is it? I know, I know they say it. I'm asking what yeah. is it actually? I think that the idea of polarity itself is uh, meaningless okay. because the idea, the polarity means that it's only about big powers and big powers uh, represent, uh, have certain defined national interests. Irrespective of who is in government there, they will pursue the same international policies, geopolitical policies. So uh, the, the assumption is that after Cold War, there has been just the America-led pole, Western pole. And now you should you have multiple poles coming up. There's China, there's uh, Russia, there's, uh, you know, and in their leadership, there's a lot else. And so even if you don't like China, Russia, whatever, but, you know, they should survive. Therefore, mm. let's not support Ukraine so much, etc. So, uh, because, you know, we don't want Russia to get uh, get weakened. And I say that, that, you know, why should I bother about that? Okay. We as people should be supporting people everywhere in America. Those who are oppressed by America, those who are oppressed by Russia, those who are oppressed in China. Uh, the problem becomes when we think that uh, we have to uh, pick sides like that. And what happens then is that we are missing the fact that we are ending up going soft on or supporting uh, powers for whom this multipolarity means no, no democracy, no morality. And mm. already we are actually living in that world. This is what we need to fight against. And what is the best example of that? It is that, um, uh, you know, it means that if, you know, you can do what you like uh, without facing consequences, as long as, uh, you know, you're doing it within your sphere of influence. And essentially, uh, no one's going to pull the rules on you. Modi is able to do that, no? G20 mm. can be held here. They'll all come and party here, no problems. They will say something in their Senate or whatever about, you know, America. Russia likewise is able to say, oh, how wonderful Modi represents civilization, this, that, this, that. They're able to do business with him. Uh, Modi is able to do business with Israel. Modi is able to also say stuff about Palestine, saying, tike, tike, hamara traditional policy ye hai. Uh, and nobody is calling him out on that. And he's not the only one. Uh, hmm. All tyrants everywhere have benefited from this. So it is for people to... Uh, cherish those values and defend them and you can't defend them only in one context from your country you can't mm. defend them only when you're the victim as a community okay. or as a country or whatever you have to defend them for everyone these are universal you have to defend them universally for everyone okay so uh, i would like to like my last question to you would be uh, you, uh, where you are in life at present yeah. what are you looking sure. at like where are you going are you writing something? Are you working on something? Yeah. What is the project? So, yeah, as, yeah, absolutely. So as you know, it's <clears> been, um, I think, uh, yeah, it's over a year when uh, I left uh, a left party, the CPIML. 
so i'm still uh, invested in politics and obviously very um supportive of uh, left struggles and all of that but what i've been doing since last year it's almost exactly a year since i started last year around december 25th uh, an article of mine was published um, in the india forum which basically since you know uh, this was about what i just spoke about the fact that there is this um, danger across the world of various forces who are speaking the same language attacking the the legitimacy of universal a universal standard of democracy a universal yardstick of democracy and uh, basically i've continued to work on that and i'm uh, in the process of trying to write a book about democracy and about okay. um, so the left when it comes to i mean yes my experience in the left did contribute to that but uh, when i when i look at left mistakes there uh, especially when the left also supports the idea of multipolarity without thinking saying that oh regardless of whether there are you know we have political differences with russia china or not we should you know there are multipolar powers and multipolarity is a good thing it's going to help everybody so the obvious example that it is not you know uh, your government is not uh, you know is, is able to enjoy the benefits of multipolarity it is not harmed by it as i just showed but i'm not interested in writing or speaking so much about um, see the left uh, i'm not so much interested in what harm is being done to the left by the left's ideas that's a change that has come upon me since last year i'm more interested in how those ideas or how the left's conduct ends up serving the right because and again i'll say left right very loosely yeah, i think I that it, uh, it's harming democracy hmm. and if democracy is a shared value for all of us across the world then anyone who is genuinely interested in it should think about and i've been thinking that even about myself my own ideas my own uh, you know uh, from um, what used to be uh, firm beliefs which i'm now reviewing to think whether um you know i need to um look at the menu yeah okay that's good to know any idea what the book is called and when it's going to be out name is no idea and no no clue at all i'm still trying to get the ms out once the, okay. <laughs> once it is then we'll go through editing and we'll do that yeah i will okay. you know as soon as i get to a place when i can actually say okay i wrote one draft then i will <laughs> speak about it for sure i don't know how the drafting process for non fiction books goes but for fiction <laughs> there like three or four drafts and then there is the editor but same, uh, same here same here yeah same here thank you, if Kavita it's Ji. a good editing process yeah okay thank you kavita ji for doing this uh, this was a very rewarding experience and yeah, i yeah, hope to too. hope that whenever your book is done and out you'll be back here one more to talk once more oh, to yes, talk about these yes. things sure yeah cool. i look forward thank to you that. thank Bye. you so much thank you so much